Good morning. Well, we continue in our series in the Gospel of Mark. It's taken us some time, but we're now into chapter 13. Only three more to go, if you're counting. <laughs> Might take us some time yet, though. Uh, chapter 13 is the longest discourse or conversation in Mark's Gospel. It's often referred to as the Olivet uh, Discourse because it takes place on the Mount of Olives. We also read it or of it in the parable, parallel uh, passages of Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 21. Chapter 13 in Mark here begins with the conclusion of a long day at the temple where Jesus entered the arena of argumentation, rebuked, debated, questioned, and taught the religious leaders of Israel. Turn with me if you have your Bible with you. I encourage you to bring your own. Uh, there's also some in your pew areas to turn to and, and follow along with me. I'll read uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 13 here for us here this morning, and then I'll open in a word of prayer. Starting in chapter 13, verse 1. And he came out of the temple, one of, and one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you not see these great buildings? Do you see these great buildings? Sorry. They will be not be left here, one stone upon another, that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of war, wars, do not be alarmed. They must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. There will... These are but the beginnings of the birth pain. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And they will bring you to trial and deliver you over. Do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have put them to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. There's quite a lot going on in that passage here with us this morning. Let's pray as we open up. Father, help us now as we turn to your scriptures, your word. Father, we know we always need you. Help us to endure in you that we can be certain that our future is with the Savior and great things await us at your return. And Father, may the Holy Spirit illumine this passage to us and, and conduct that dialogue within us in the very core of our being so that we might hear beyond the voice of a mere man, that we might hear from you, the living God. And may you give to us to think clearly, to feel deeply, and to respond properly to your word. Christ's name. Amen. Well, when we look and we turn on the TV, you listen to the radio, and we see the news that's happening right now over in Ukraine, we see a lot of 
uh, destruction. People are fleeing, uh, running, trying to find shelter, the basic necessities. Basically, we can't even imagine the pain, the hurt, the displacement of these people, the suffering, the vast destruction that has happened in, in that country in multiple cities. And we often find ourselves asking ourselves, is this the start of World War III? Is this the end? End time fears and excitement seem to ignite in every generation when wars and rumors of wars happen. Panic seems to always be centered on when the world or when the end of the world will come and the various predictions that follow. Today, like our passage at hand, we see beautiful buildings, homes, being turned into rubble. Now, this thought has stuck in my mind, mental picture, if you want to say, when I read of the words of Jesus here in this passage. He pictures a horrifying Horizon filled with deadly destruction, enough to make Christians run. The first few verses here are crucial for properly understanding the teaching in this chapter. Turn with me again to, to Mark chapter 13, verse 1, and, and we'll take a look at it here. It says, And he came, sorry, he came out of the temple. And one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful, or maybe your, your translation has massive stones, what wonderful or magnificent buildings. Now, it's hard for us to imagine we're quite a few years past. But consider what the disciples were looking at. Um, you can Google kind of what the, the temple looked like, their best um, description and mock in, in picture form of what it would look like. The temple mount, which contains the temple facilities, as I said a few weeks back, is over 35 and a half acres in size. It's about a sixth of Jerusalem. It's a large area. It's supported and encompassed by walls of massive stones. How massive? Well, the largest average, about 20 feet, 25 feet long. That's about half this room. 12 feet high. That's higher than our walls here, and eight feet deep. You're looking basically at a semi-truck trailer. These are big stones. Inside on the mount, the walls are lined with porticles, or porches as we would say now. That, are, that were about 45 feet deep, held up by two rows of marble columns, 37 and a half feet high. The royal portico is 197 yards long and 35 yards, not feet deep. The roof over this porch was supported by 162 marble columns, 27 feet It would take three men to stretch their arms around a single column. The mount supported a complex of large courts, colonnades, and buildings, the most important, of course, being the temple itself, which rose about 100 feet and was plated on the outside with gold. It was vast. 
And no wonder the admiration of the disciples as they look back and they see this ginormous building and they make this passing comment. Whoa, what a wonderful building. What amazing stones. And that passing comment makes Jesus or gives, uh, gives rise to Jesus' teaching. The temple is going to be destroyed. Verse 2 says, And Jesus said to him, Do you not, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Yeah, right. After the size of these stones being explained, how can the disciples understand that this is going to be destroyed? The temple was Israel. It was Judaism. This was the dwelling of God. This was the only place in the world where a Jew may offer a sacrifice to his God. This was not merely symbolic ground. It was the holiest ground in all of creation at that time. And Jesus greets their exp expression of delight with a sober, frightening response that it will all be destroyed. And the disciples thought that the temple would stand forever. But it would only be a few short years before the Romans would strip the temple of all its precious metals, tear it down stone by stone, never to be built again. Scary, isn't it? Things that we think are so permanent in our lives, in fact, are only temporary. The things we own, our wealth, our health, our families, our accomplishments, all these things that we think are important really are temporary. At any moment, the rug can be pulled out from underneath us. It is then that faith in Jesus and the assurance, the comfort, and the hope that he offers is all that matters. This is something that I had to learn this past week. When we think of the temple, it's hard for us to imagine this. I haven't been there, but even if you have been to Jerusalem, stood by the Wailing Wall, that is all that there is left of the foundation of the temple of Herod the Great. All that I mentioned earlier in describing the size of the temple was built above the Wailing Wall, all to be destroyed. We have built temples in our own lives, and those too will be temples. Nalster begs words, the temple said to God's people, this is where God is known. It was at the very heart of everything they understood about God's revelation of himself. For the disciples, <clears throat> the temple was at the epic center of all their Jewish universe. Remember that God had established his presence among his people of old in the Ark of the Covenant that they took with them as they moved around uh, in their wilderness wanderings throughout the Old Testament. And eventually that was brought here and placed in this temple. This was built for God. This is where God is known. This is where they could encounter him. Only one spot, not like today, where we have Christ. 
This is the temple where Isaiah had seen the glory of God in his vision found in Isaiah chapter 6, proclaiming the coming judgment. And where Jesus' parents found him after being separated in their visit to Jerusalem. We see that in Luke chapter 2, verses 4 to 9. But as we saw a few weeks back in Mark chapter 11, verse 17, the temple was being used as a den of robbers. And this disgusted Jesus and prompted the removal of the temples in this claim that the temple would be destroyed. He that was greater was going to do something about it. Verse 3 says, And he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately. The Mount of Olives is a hill overlooking the temple mount. To speak publicly of the destruction of the temple would have been the same, would have had the same reaction as someone already at odds with the authorities um, the other month, standing outside the parliament building in Ottawa, pronouncing that it would be destroyed. Kind of the same feel. Not quite, obviously, but give us an illustration anyway. They, they then asked two questions that led to Jesus' longest discourse in Mark's gospel. Verse 4 says, tell us then, will, this, will these things be? When will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Matthew helps us a bit to get behind the questions as, as Mark records them. It could be that the disciples are merely asking about the destruction of the temple and drawing no further conclusions than that. It was a dreadful event. Enough said. But listen to their questions in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And I've looked this over, read up on it, studied it a little bit. And I've, in my reading over on this, I found and noticed that they never ask why. Why is the temple going to be destroyed? Most of us, I believe, know the answer. Long story short, because it's not going to be needed. Matthew chapter 12, verse 6, records the words of Jesus saying, Something greater than the temple is here. The destruction of the temple is actually a judgment on the spiritual blindness of those to whom Jesus came. Jesus came to his own, and his own rejected him. We see that again in John chapter 1, verse 11. The, the Pharisees, the Herodians, way back in Mark, early on, Mark chapter 3, are opposed to him saying, we must destroy him. And now Jesus is saying to his disciples, the very temple, which is the epic center of everything they regarded about knowing God, it's all going to be destroyed and the reason for this he is saying is because he's going up to Jerusalem to suffer and die at the hands of cruel men and to make a once and for all provision for sin and we see that in Hebrews chapter 10 and once that happens there will be no need for this temple anymore Calvin says of the disciples, the vast size, the wealth of the temple hung like a veil before the eyes of the disciples, preventing them from elevating their faith to the true reign of Christ. The disciples here were in danger of missing what Jesus came to do. And it's the same for us today. 
Only when the temple structures, the walls of our religious theology, doctrine have crumbled, are we able to say, only in Christ, only in the Savior, only in his sacrifice is the answer to my sin. Only through faith in Christ can we be saved, not our actions. And this might be hard to hear for some. Some of us haven't made that transition yet. You still haven't cast yourself entirely on the mercy and the grace and the provision of God. In through the Lord Jesus Christ. Basically, we're still saying as we enter in on Sunday morning, this is a terrific building. I'm glad that I can meet God here or maybe a different church building there. But here's the thing. There is no special place to meet God anymore. There's no special rooms, no special building, no sanctuary. We use that term here pretty loosely to describe this part of the church building. But that's Roman Catholicism. That's not the Bible. We, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are the temple now after receiving Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus is no more present in this room than he is in the bathrooms out there in the foyer. That's a little harsh, but it's true. If that doesn't make the point, nothing will. The fact is that the destruction of the notion must take place before a person lays hold of Christ. Saul, as we know, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, is the poster boy of this. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6, we see that Paul explains to the people that he has followed the law to a T. He's dotted all the I's to have acceptance with God. He was born perfectly in a line. Did all the right things. It didn't work. His legalistic ways did nothing for him. All these credentials that he had meant nothing. And what he's saying in that passage in is that I gave up on all the inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally. This is what God wants from us, a personal relationship with him. To bring others into the same personal relationship with him. Our anticipation of the end time should fuel our urgency of our work, the great commission not distracted from us build relationships so that God could be honored praised pointing them to Christ his kingdom continues to be built and that starts with us Christ flowing out from us us sharing the gospel to others. A sense of Jesus' imminent return should always remind us that while we're in this world, while this world is temporary, our relationship with God is eternal. Jesus' initial response is not to point out the signs, but to caution his disciples from being deceived by signs. Verses 5 to 8 says, And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. 
But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of birth pains. There have been many people, and there will be many more, who will lead people astray. And if we don't want to be led astray, then we need to know our Bibles. We need to bring them. We need to look at them. We need to look at the scriptures to see what God is saying. This is why I encourage you to bring your own so that you can mark them up. You can cross-examine what I'm saying or what others are saying with the word of God. Wars, rumors, nations against nations, earthquakes, famines. These all happen in Jesus' generation. By 70 AD, all these things happen. And the fall of Jerusalem. They are not signs. They are the beginning of sorrows. All this happened immediately after the day of Pentecost. Jesus then prepares his disciples for the persecution that they will face. Verse 9 starts out saying, but be on your guard. This is necessary to do even for us today. But we should already be on guard. The disciples still have it in their minds that Jesus is about to usher in and usher in the kingdom in such a way that will vanish or vanquish all his enemies. He wants them to understand that they will face harsh opposition. However, they will only be temporary. Verse 9 continues, For they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. The book of Acts is a great book. And there in Acts lays out the persecution of the disciples that they faced after they began preaching. Peter and John were imprisoned. We see that in Acts chapter 4, verse 3. Paul and Silas were beaten and imprisoned. We see that in Acts chapter 16. Paul was brought before Galileo in Acts chapter 28. Felix in Acts chapter 24. Agrippa in Acts chapter 25. Stephen was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. And James was killed by Herod. In Acts chapter 12. A lot of gruesome. Only temporary. Because they're eternally. With Christ. Even so their mission to preach the gospel. Will prevail. They knew that. Verses 10 to 11 says. And the gospel must be proclaimed to all nations. And when. They bring you to trial, deliver you over. Do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Some would argue that verse 10 has not happened yet. People are still trying to get to the gospel throughout all the nations. But if you turn over to Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, for a moment, it says this. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testament to all nations, and then the end will come. Was the gospel preached to all nations, to the whole world, by 70 A.D.? a good question one we need to ask ourselves the word world here was reference to the Roman Empire and we see it in Luke chapter 2 verse 1 of, of Christ's birth story where Caesar Augustus took a census of the whole world all the inhabited earth that being the Roman Empire and if you do a word study on these words you'll find this to be true the end in view here in this context 
is the end or destruction which was to come upon Jerusalem and the temple ending the Jewish age. Did the gospel reach the whole world? I believe so. Paul declares that the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven in Colossians chapter 1, verses 5 to 6, and again in verse 23. This happened by 62 AD. If you're looking at a timetable of events to help out. Romans chapter 1 verse 8 talks about how Paul thanked the believers of their faith in proclaiming it throughout the world. Paul traveled through Asia Minor, Greece, Crete. Scripture also mentions him in Italy, Spain, and Gaul. And we find that in Romans chapter 15 verses 24 to 28, we find that he's traveled in these places. That is 30 years to establish churches and preach the gospel to the world at that time. Is there still work to do today? Yes. I believe so, but more so in believing and doing the word than hearing it the first time. Why would the apostles be hated in all the nations? Why would the apostles being killed and persecuted if they had not preached the gospel in all nations. They were hated by all the nations because they preached in all the nations. Verses 12 to 13 closes our section here this morning saying, and brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated by all of my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus warned that those loyal to him could find themselves choosing between their family and faith. As the hostility of living in a fallen world breaks upon us, betrayal will strike very close to the hearts of believers. Just as it did to the Savior, to our Savior. It will hit hard in our own homes. All of us have different experiences of the effects of sin in our lives. And we shouldn't be surprised that some of our family would betray us if one of Jesus' hand-picked apostles did the same to him. Again, Jesus' point is not when such persecution comes, then the end is near. But that these things will take place and do not mean the end has come. Trials, whether they be persecutions or simply general troubles of a fallen world, have been the common course of Christ's followers and will continue to be for the future as we are able to see into it. What matters is that we persevere whatever may come our way, whether we are attacked by persecution or tempted by the world's seductions, whether Christ's coming seems distant or at hand, we persevere. What matters is that the gospel continues to be preached throughout the world whether in our neighborhood or far away. He who stands firm to the end will be saved. And by the grace of our God, he will keep us firm, planted. He who began a good work within us will carry it unto completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. It's clear in all the places you expect it to be clear. And where it seems a little tenuous for us, it's in order that we might be humble. 
and also that we might realize that the things that you want us to really lay hold of are the things that you have made so perfectly plain. Father, help us not to be alarmed. Help us to learn from the metaphor in this passage of birth pains. And help us, Lord, to be on guard, to not fall into temptation. And may we be ready, watching, praying, hoping, and looking for your return. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.